Well, here, here's the thing. It, you have to get the dose. The dose is very critical. At a, at, if you take, say, I would say a half a gram to a gram every day, my experience of that was simply a kind of anxiety, a kind of a, a being set forward, a speed type effect. Uh, if you take, if you say, well, then I don't want that, so I'm going to lift the dose slightly and you go to, say, two and a half grams, the problem I had with that is life quickly evolves into being so strange that you, I couldn't handle it. In other words, it's very important for me to dip into these places and then to get out, towel off, and think about it. Uh, the, however, you know, uh, there is a there is a, a a streak of the chicken shit in me. I think if you if you really want to leave us all behind and ordin you know bourgeois values and your job and Bill Clinton and the ozone hole and all of that behind, then if you start taking psilocybin, let's say four grams every three days, I guarantee you within a month there will be very few people that you will have much in common with <laughs> and, and you will be very happy. You will be very happy. Ladies and gentlemen. Alan, it's a possibility, isn't it? The very word secrecy is repugnant. Secrets. In a free and open society. And we are, as a people, inherently and historically opposed to secret societies, to secret oaths, and to secret proceedings. We decided long ago that the dangers of excessive and unwarranted concealment of pertinent facts far outweighed the dangers constant extreme danger which are cited to justify it even today there is little value in opposing the threat of a closed society by imitating its arbitrary restrictions even today there is little value in ensuring the survival of our nation if our traditions do not survive with it and there is very grave danger extreme danger that an announced need for increased security. What the hell is going on? This is Conspiracy Queries with Alan Hart. Will be seized upon by those anxious to expand its meaning to the very limits of official censorship and concealment. That I do not intend to permit to the extent that it's in my control. You're crazy. And no officious, high or low, civilian or military, should interpret my words here tonight as an excuse to censor the news, to stifle dissent cover up our mistakes. Isn't the Pentagon suspicious that all the buildings would blow up? Or to withhold from the press and the public. I think you're just looking at things for the first time. The facts they deserve to know. You've had your whole fucking life to think things over. What good's a few minutes more gonna do you now? The facts they deserve to know. They deserve to know. to know. Deserve to know.
facts yeah. that deserve to know. Go ahead. Right. Doing it. Doing it right now. Thanks a lot for the uh, reminder. Appreciate that. Some sort of elevated existence. It doesn't mean I'm better than anybody. It just means I'm better than I was before. Better than me. Yeah, that's the... Um, it's probably the longest theme song to a podcast at all. And people skip it past it all the time, I guess. I do. But I don't, because I like listening to it. There it is. There's the raven. All right, let's get started. Welcome to the show. We're doing another one, looks like. <laughs> Who would have figured? Welcome to uh, this week's. Yeah, that's what I was waiting for. I knew that little bugger was in there somewhere. I'm raising the fist. I'm getting to it. Hang on. Oh, here come the horses. All right. Yeah. Yeah. It's going to be a fascinating show today because it's about the law. We do have a lawyer. Oh, there's the calls lighting up now. Get them off. We don't like lawyers. You'll like this guy. Trust me. He's our guest today. So let's talk about who he is on Green Crush Conspiracy Queries with Alan Park. We are at episode 122 of Conspiracy Queries. And Green Crush 50, 5 0. Where will we be later? We don't know. Things are changing. Exciting things are happening in the world, good and bad. But they're definitely exciting. I don't mean that in a good way. I just mean they excite. You get all worked up about it. I do. Lots of shit going on right now. And new laws are coming into the cannabis scene. And of course, Green Crush is about the laws as well as it is the actual substance, because your green substance is crushing the laws that are preventing us getting access to this plant. I've always said that. That's the name of the show. And as we keep finding people in the loop, here's, a, here's our guest today. <laughs> You're not going to believe this guy. He has a book called The Margolin Guide, The State of California and United States Federal Marijuana Laws. Know the laws and your rights. So listen up, because you probably live in one of these states if you're listening to this show. You also might be in a province in Canada, and you should also listen up. The laws are going to be remarkably similar. Anybody that can understand this mother tongue I'm trying to get through, it's going to benefit you. Even if you live in a different country, you can still take this information and um, help yourself formulate uh, a, a similar platform from your nationality you know what i mean but basically it's the same thing the law almost everywhere very very similar enough so that a canadian can discuss things with an american so please welcome to the show when we get to him bruce m margolin attorney at law he's got an app called 420 laws it's an app it tells you what's up mm, the sound of ice he is the uh, cri he has been the criminal defense attorney of the year He's been named a criminal defense super lawyer, which I hope doesn't mean you wind up after dealing with him in a supermax prison. But I'm sure he's, I'm sure he's not uh, that at all. He's he's trying to keep people out of there for like 50 years now. Bruce Margolin has uh, represented clients in all kinds of criminal matters, uh, but now um, <clears throat> primarily to do with cannabis. This is amazing. And since 1973 has been the director of Los Angeles National Organization for the Reform of Marijuana Laws, also known as NORML, and O-R-M-L, and was also an advisor for Proposition 215. And if you don't live in California, uh, you don't know that means Californians for... Comp I slurred that, did you hear that? Cal California, uh, Californians for Compassionate Use, and has also served as legal counsel for the California Hemp Initiative, a very dapper and suave looking gentleman. Uh, Paul knows him. You know Paul on the show. If you listen to the show regularly, you know Paul is, uh, is um, <laughs> he's experienced some turns and twists with the law. And uh, Bruce helped him. So he's in Hollywood. He's in West Hollywood. 
We'll get to all that later. But uh, if you're just listening now, uh, jump on. He charges 420 for this publication, by the way, which is pretty cool. Um, and uh, he, he, yeah, there's this app. So let's get that again. 420. So 420 Laws, L A W S. Check it out. And uh, I haven't uh, I haven't downloaded the thing myself, but we will be getting to Bruce soon. I'm so glad he's on the show. I'm Canadian, as you may know. Alan Park uh, of Green Crush uh, of uh, living in this country. So this is why I've been talking about Canadian laws coming down the pike for a long time. And so much of the bad stuff has happened that I was able to uh, glean earlier on, predict. You know, you could see patterns going. What I didn't see was that when I told that uh, reprehensible uh, bringer of garbage, Kathleen Wynne, that I was uh, shouting her down and, and taking her to task for her nonsensical distribution system of cannabis. Nothing but a series of impediments and problems and hassles. It's going to cost money. It was ridiculous. Wanted to put brick and mortar stores everywhere, but was only going to put 40 across an area the size of Texas or whatever compared to Hamilton, which has already got 100 right now. Small town within that giant province. Not smart. Like not thinking, not being open to reality. Like you could say, let's put 40 stores out next year and, and then 40 more later and we'll just keep doing that. You're not thinking. It doesn't work like that. People aren't going to drive across the province to go to the designated. Anyway, she's gone, lost in the election. A lot of people upset about it including members of her own party, because she pretty much spanked her ass on the way out of the door with, what was it, two seats left or whatever it was, two, eight seats? Not enough. Not enough anyway. And I feel good about it. Not the part that we have another guy in where we have to contend with it with a different colored tie, but I really brought it to her. Personally. Put my friggin' heart on the line. Told her the truth. Told her that she was lying about a lot of the aspects of cannabis that they have used fiction to be able to wrap it up in a series of bullshit architecture and then they're going to stuff it down our throats. And uh, those not informed and pay attention on the outsides, and that's not a criticism, so not everybody uses cannabis, and I'm not saying everybody should, although they should. Uh, but uh, people saying like, oh, it's going to be legal soon. You must be thrilled, huh? No. I'm not thrilled. They're doing it wrong. I'm not a fan of that. However, we do have this new blue tide fella, and he's made a lot of things that have a lot of, uh, well, let's call them mistakes, a lot of different mistakes, a, a lot of impositions, some lies already. They said they weren't going to get rid of, um, they said they weren't going to get rid of this pilot project for uh, low earner income or whatever it was. I wasn't even familiar with it, but they, uh, they got rid of it and they promised that they wouldn't while they were campaigning. <laughs> so, you know, we're back to the same thing. This guy, Doug Ford, has not put together a, a cogent plan up to date until yesterday. And it, it's still not fully fleshed out. And I don't understand it. And a lot of people who have a lot more time invested into it than I do aren't, aren't really, you know, 100% comfortable with everything. But basically, here's where we're at. Um, they're not going to be these ridiculous, stupid poorly thought out despite all of the warning signs Kathleen Wynn's team of clowns are now gone so I know the other guys you're not happy with but be happy the clowns are gone we got new clowns I guess but this whole right suppression thing now this Doug Ford is putting in a different option we're not going to be opening these stores that Kathleen Wynn paid $650,000 to buy a fucking logo for something that's not even going to exist. First of all, it sucked at the time, and that's probably why I don't get any kind of voiceover work from the Leo Burnett company, because I call them out on it. It's a fucking circle with three letters in it. <laughs> 650000 bucks. well done. I wish I could make a couple of circle designs and make uh, over half a million bucks. Must be nice. However, that's not going to happen now because it was a stupid friggin' plan. She went ahead with it. I don't really blame Burnett as much as I do the, the government. You know, they were just providing a logo. They're like, here's a circle in three letters. Give us a <laughs> half a million bucks, you idiot. And she said, okay, this is a woman running the money of the entire province, supposedly. $650,000 for a logo we can't use. And it sucked. I mean, it really was. 
a horrible looking logo. Even the guys that made the Vancouver Canucks sweater, the V thing, were going, oh my God, that was, that's horrible. But before we get to things local, and uh, there's been a lot of stuff going on in this country, Canada, boy, oh boy, we always like to think we're, you know, right up there with the states, and we never are, because we don't go to all those countries that they invade, but, you know, we do it. attend some of them, and now we're in a dust-up with this Saudi Arabia clan. And they're all upset with us because, now I'm not saying, uh, uh, you know, that the minister involved, Christian Freeland, should have or should not have tweeted what she tweeted. But all she tweeted was uh, the fact that Saudi Arabia is a bit pushy with some human rights and they should smarten up. They have now freaked out about this, pointing out their shortcomings. I've been a fan of this for a long time, by the way. A fan of, of showing the bad side of Saudi Arabia because how can you conscionably live in a country that on the one hand it, it, it attacks ISIS and rightly so because they cut off heads but then when the Saudis actually literally look it up cut off more heads than ISIS but they're your friends and you're selling them weapons and you're giving a shit what they say then I, I you know I'm not okay with that and so I didn't really like the fact that General Dynamics, the company General Dynamics that supplies military vehicles, uh, had a contract drummed up by Tory Stephen Harper, conservative rather, Stephen Harper. Horrible deal at the time. But what about the jobs? You're getting people in London, Ontario to profit from the fact that dead people are uh, exploding inside of Yemeni hospitals? Like, what? That's your plan? That's your plan. Okay, great. So then Trudeau comes along and says, you know, everything about Harper sucks and vote for me and everybody falls for it and they do it. And of course, he continues the same plan with General Dynamics selling all of these uh, military equipments to these gingham uh, champions. I called it what they were gingham just out of lack of respect for their headgear considering. I mean, I get a lot of lack of respect for my headgear so I can take a punch. <laughs> but what the hell's going on up there? Wear what you want, but if you're going to be a rights-abusing bastard while you're at it, uh, you're, you're open game to be made fun of. They're selling off their Canadian securities in response to Ottawa's criticism of the arrest of a female activist. Riyadh, that's uh, in, I guess that's where they do their Operation Saudi Central uh, news bullshit from. They say they're ready to take the step despite financial losses. They want to stop everything. They're pulling students out of schools. Are we going to get our wheat board back? Is Saskatchewan going to get the wheat board? We sold these idiots the wheat board. We sold it because they have a grain company and because they've been so nice to us with the oil over the decades. Thought it'd be a good idea to put some Canadian grain in their fucking hands. So, you know, they're really a pain in the ass. Then we got this guy, John Baird, jumping up and telling us what a, what a disaster we are for giving them a hard time. Oh, God. So now let's move up out of the politics and back into cannabis themed things because that's what this is really here in canada the marijuana police squad is put on hold despite the looming deadline this is in ontario speaking of london with just two more months before uh, recreational marijuana becomes legal staffing of a special squad that ontario has planned to snuff out black market pot has suddenly been put on hold let me just say that again so this old pot plan they were trying to get together, and all the cops want to do it, of course. Once again, they were the first consultees when they were going to flip this pie over, stupidly and wrongly so. But now they're pissed off that um, they can't put boots to the ground of their special squad, snuffing out black market pot. I mean, can you see the Brooklyn Nine-Nine on this thing? Bunch of fucking idiots. Hey, are you just uh, relieving your pain right there with that thing that grew in the ground? How about some jail time for you? Sick and tired of this mindset. So what are we going to do with this uh, special squad of snuffing out black market pot? How you snuff out black market pot would be to make it all legal. You <laughs> stupid idiots. You just um, stop criminalizing it. Okay, don't tell us, oh, we have to get more cops and you smokers of pot are going to cost us more money at the municipal level and it's going to be hard to, you know, we're going to have to pay. No, you don't. You're just making that choice because you're a bitch. But under the former liberal government, now flushed where it belongs, the province in March announced the creation of a provincial operation. This is the uh, black market quashing 
boots on the ground. The Canadian, the Cannabis Intelligence Coordination Center, the CICC. I mean, do we need another alphabet agency that's going to abscond with gigantic budgets and have nothing to show for it just to be able to fuck with people's rights? To shut down illegal pot shops and combat the black market supply of marijuana after the drug becomes legal and if it were decriminalized, there wouldn't be a need to hire all these cops. See, this is what all the thinking and the planning was, right? This is what they were doing in the first place when they finally realized, okay, 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 we're going to have to make cannabis legal in this country. People look to us. We're going to have to set it up. And they went so cop heavy, boots on the ground heavy, Cannabis Intelligence Coordination Center. You'd have to get an entire farmer's field of fucks for me to care about that. What a bunch of self-appointed assholes. Legal weed was originally expected as early as July 1, but the federal law allowing recre... Allowing? Just the premise. <laughs> this is mainstream press. This is why some people call it fake and they're right to do so. Allowing recreational... Can I... Is it okay? Teacher... Teacher, can I get a hall pass so I can go to the bathroom? Ontario's released no other information about its secretive task force, which is to be funded by the province and made up of officers drawn from police forces across the... These guys don't need a whole bunch of extra employment because all of a sudden other folks are enjoying their rights. This whole premise sucks. I'm sick of this shit. It's getting worse while they're giving the illusion it's getting better. Every single word matters in these stories of bullshit. Now, hiring police officers for the CICC has been put on hold. Fucking good. Said Sarnia Mayor Mike Bradley, who doubles as a member of his city's police services board. I mean, God, I'm, this is sometimes why I don't read the whole thing ahead of time, eh, Russell? I mean, it says right here, this is like, here's a lesson in conflict of interest. So this guy is a cop. He's on the police services board helping out the cops while he's being the mayor. Making sure we can get a CICC so folks like me and you can't use something that's been put here that we can use for our health. This whole thing is skewed. This tool Bradley, the mayor cop, says, I don't understand how they can't move forward on it, especially a government that's so committed to law and order. The deadline for legalization is so close. I, I I really, I don't want to take the time to do this, but I'm going to do it anyway. I have to see a picture of this guy because I'm getting an image like the Stay Puft Mar Marshmallow Man or something. Sarnia Mayor Mike Bradley, the cop mayor. Yeah, good for you. Let's see this dude. I mean, it's just ridiculous. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay, I see it, right. He, he doesn't look like how I thought he was going to look, but... Um, Definitely, definitely shades of weasel going on there. Sarnia Mayor Mike Bradley. Uh, you don't understand how they're not moving forward on it because I don't know why uh, Doug Ford has taken the tack of using uh, what they're going to do here, the new, per the new premier. They're going to usher in a system of uh, buying it online. Uh, so the, I guess Kathleen Wynne's 40 stores of brick and mortar won't be built. But they're going to buy it online immediately, or, well, not immediately, but when it becomes uh, available on October 17th, and then uh, as, I think it's April 1st next year, um, it's going to open up things a little more. They're going to have shops here and there, but it's not. And I've got really good news for you, folks. You don't have to wait till October 17th to buy it online. I buy it online all the time. It's already happening. It's been happening forever. This is all cartoons here. Just choosing to, oh, I better observe the regulation. No, no, no. You better point out that the regula <laughs> regulation is a rights imposition. Sarnia police plan to hire one officer on a two-year contract to work on the task force. So, in other words, this mayor's got a buddy who he wanted to give a job for two years on the public tit. Now he's all disappointed it's not coming together. 
And when the police board met last month to approve the hiring, the city's deputy chief told Bradley the process had been paused, the mayor said, adding the board gave the green light in anticipation of the hold being lifted. I cannot see them not proceeding with this, said the whiny bastard. The sooner the, the, sooner the better, the nine-term mayor said of the new Doug Ford government. I know they put a pause on everything. But you would think this would be a priority to move forward. Shut up, Sarnia Mayor Cop. You're wrong. Especially when uh, <laughs> here we are in, uh, it says here that um, the future of the CICC is, is also at peril, which is good. You can't even believe uh, the, the, spreadsheet, the spreadsheet on this, but I'm kind of running out of time. Got to get to our guest pretty soon. Um, but here's another problem we do have to address, and I will be addressing it with our guest, Bruce Margolin, who will be on the line shortly. Um, listen to this thing. This is <laughs> a CTV report of uh, all things cannabis, I suppose. I can't get it right to the beginning. Hold on, let's see. Yeah, Lisa Laflamme of CTV News. Here we go. Are, are you there, Lisa? <laughs> are you coming in? On a, an unsettling number of Canadians now admit to driving high. One out of seven people surveyed by Statistics Canada say they got behind the wheel within two hours of using cannabis. Men were nearly twice as likely as women. Ottawa has given the green light to one road test. There are some red flags, though. Here's senior political correspondent Glenn McGregor. This device will become the first approved in Canada to test drivers for marijuana impairment. The but CTV News 5, has found 000. concerns about the Draeger Drug Test 5000 over both its speed and accuracy. It's inevitable that we're going to see constitutional challenges as soon as this device hits the road. Police. Fucking right. Constitutional challenges as soon as this device hits the road because it doesn't work and it tells lies. Okay, cops. You guys had all the extra time at the beginning of this legalization. Too late. You're out. I'm calling it the first device said to be approved by the federal government for roadside saliva tests to determine marijuana impairment isn't suited for cold weather. Have you checked Canada's weather? I mean, these guys are in Canada, right? <laughs> says here if it's cold out it's found to give fairly large proportions of false positive or false negative results and let's also remind ourselves that if we are showing positive for cannabis it's not even an, an affirmation that you are impaired the Draeger drug test 5000 has been uh, well our justice minister has published a notice of intention to approve it and list it as approved drug screening equipment because she knows nothing for law enforcement to use at the roadside to test for both THC and cocaine. However, CTV News has found concerns about the efficacy. And this is a mainstream news organization. I've been saying uh, about the inefficacy of these people and their fucking machines for a long time. Sorry I'm swearing a lot today. I've been repressed, camped, sort of pushed together in a little cube. A lot of things happening lately. Lost a few people. I'm a bit on edge. I'll admit it. Doesn't change the accuracy of the reportage. It's inevitable that we're going to see constitutional challenges as soon as this device hits the roads. This is something that is a significant departure from what the Supreme Court has authorized and what police have been doing so far. Etc., etc., etc. What are we going to do about that? Well, before we go to our friend, we're about to do this. Let me get Bruce's number up here on the ding banger. And, uh, boom, 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 boom. Okay. Let's see. Oh, my goodness. Kimmy, Kim, Kim. Uh, there it is. Okay, fantastic. Copy. Yeah, this is getting nuts. I mean, these cops, I've been saying this for a long time, that they're, they've been nervous because they've known the whole time that they are, uh, uncertain about where their bold step into a new uh, frontier of taking our rights away is going to leave them and understandable uh, because um, I'm not going to take this shit I certainly uh, am not going to take this uh, I can't wait to get into court if, if I am so arrested by this now I can't seem to get that number on there damn uh, alright so let's um, before we I was going to call him in a second hang on Kyla Lee 
is a Vancouver criminal lawyer. So this is Canada now, and we'll see what she has to say about this, and then we're going to spend some time with Bruce. She, um, she says the government-approved saliva drug tester is fatally flawed. Kyla Lee. Dot C-A. K-Y-L-A. L-E-E dot C-A. She says the Canadian government announced that it's finally chosen the Draeger Drug Test 5000. The device is subject to numerous flaws. I discuss some of the pitfalls generally with saliva testing, and none of those pitfalls are cured by the Draeger Drug Test 5000. Now that we know what the device is that's coming, we can identify which specific pitfalls apply to this device. So here's what we have to look out for. Major concerns with the individual's charter rights at the roadside when using a saliva tester. The Draeger Drug Test 5000 is a much different than a roadside breathalyzer, and that is one of the reasons why the constitutional rights are very much on the line here. The Supreme Court of Canada has confirmed that roadside drug testing and alcohol testing is already a violation of the charter right to counsel and right to be secure against unreasonable search and seizure. However, the violation is justified on the basis of the fact that the tests are predicated on a reasonable suspicion and conducted forthwith. This means immediately. However, the roadside saliva testing chosen by the government will not be done immediately. The device, the Draeger 5000, requires that a swab be rubbed in the mouth for two to three minutes between the gum and the cheek in order to capture enough saliva for a suitable sample. After that, the analysis process also takes time, although the government claims it's only a few minutes. Oh, it's only a few minutes multiplied by everybody, and it doesn't work. The Draeger Drug Test 5000 literature explains that this can be five to ten minutes in total. Imagine that when they're pulling them all over at the, uh, you know how it is with the ride checks. There's like 50 cars sitting there. You're going to be there for hours, buddy. These idiots don't even know this shit doesn't work. So a person could be detained and, oh, back to the blog. So a person could be detained and subject to this search for close to 15 minutes. All the while, there's no right to call a lawyer. Worse still, the search is far more invasive than a breath test. Your body naturally expels air and the courts have considered... That since breathing is natural and the breathalyzer is just capturing that breath, the privacy concerns are mitigated. But a few minutes worth of saliva buildup in the recesses of your mouth is a whole other story. We're talking about a bodily fluid that can reveal a great deal about a person and something that is not normally expelled. In fact, it's an offense to expel it otherwise in public. And then there are the concerns about functionality. Not only does it require a minimum volume of saliva, which some people may not be able to produce, (laughs) especially if you got dry mouth, eh, dude? Uh, But it also requires it to be collected and analyzed in a certain temperature range, 5 to 40 degrees. So that's 5 degrees above freezing for you Americans. uh, That'd be like uh, 38 degrees Celsius. So from 38 degrees Celsius to uh, like 110 or 120 degrees, anything outside of that doesn't work. So it's also not going to work in in, in hot, you know, Arizona or when California is on fire. It's not going to work here most of the time. Yeah, I don't know, I uh, didn't want to get into too much of a geography lesson, but, you know, for most of the year, um, we're outside that temperature range. <laughs> if Canadians cannot get reliable results most of the year, then the device should not be used. It's useless for the stated goal of public safety, and it's useless for protecting charter rights. The Draeger Drug Test 5000 poses significant operational concerns for police. If police allow the subject to hold the swab themselves and collect the saliva themselves, there are concerns about letting an untrained person do it and not collecting a suitable sample. Alternatively, if the police do it, can you imagine with, uh, what these guys do, them taking like an, a Q-tip and jamming it into your gums? I don't know if you've seen a lot of their activities online lately, but this isn't the gang of folks I need uh, access to be shoving things into my face. If police allow the subject to hold themselves and collect themselves, oh, sorry, if they do it, they compromise their safety. The officer will have to be in close physical proximity with the driver for several minutes with one hand occupied. (laughs) Oh, God. And uh, while most people uh, will probably be cooperative, Yeah, they probably will. 
Um, uh, that will pose a safety risk for officers who are unable to defend themselves. After all, they're testing people whom they suspect are under the influence of drugs. If that person turns violent, it could pose a serious phys physical risk to one-armed police officers. And then there's the issue of the operation of the device itself and how the cops are going to be recording the steps they took in collecting the sample, giving the instructions, and operating the device. It's hard enough, in my experience, says this lawyer, Kyla Lee, for the police to articulate how they operated a breathalyzer, which they've had decades of practice with, and that device only has two buttons. <laughs> oh, God. Remember when they lowered the IQ for cops in 2000? Uh, this, the steps to do this in both a safe and sanitary way while following the manufacturer's direction, are going to be stumbling blocks for the police in court. Which, uh, uh, and that all comes out as tax dollars, huh? What concerns me the most is the major pilot project undertaken by the federal government for the testing of these devices did not look at the ultimate device chosen. The Draeger Drug Test 5000 was not thoroughly studied across Canada. This fits with what's becoming a disturbing trend about B Bill C-46 and its implementation Regulate it first and worry about the science later. Exactly. There are very real concerns this saliva testing device is going to violate Canadians' constitutional rights, risk putting police in danger, and be operated in circumstances that can contribute to unreliable results. Kind of like voting. More is needed before it is approved. That's why they're shitting their pants. Okay. Let's, um, I don't know what's going on. I go like this, I go, you know, copy this thing, copy, here we go, now, here we go. I don't know why that wasn't working before. Let's hope it is now. Oh, my goodness. Oh, God. I'm just, uh, having trouble with my Skype thing. Again. Hang on. Uh, ooh, 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 uh, uh, uh. Oh, God. This is what they're doing in Canada. This is, you know, I thought we were going to wrap all this up a long time ago. Here we go. Let's see if we got to... I don't know if I can hear this. Mm -mm -mm. Ringy, ringy. It's, um... It's ringing, apparently. How come I'm not hearing anything, Russell? Anybody know anything? Um... Because we haven't chatted on Skype yet. What are you talking about? We did that yesterday. Uh, okay. Well, that's neat. Um, <laughs> fantastic. This is this is what I got to do here. This guy here. Call. Okay, that's good. That's Russell for you. Let's get uh, Bruce on the line here. Bruce Good afternoon. Oh, hello. Is Bruce there, please? We are doing the radio show. Oh, okay. You were supposed to call his cell phone. Ah, well, thank you. I will take that up with... 310? Uh... Oh, don't say 310? it. 310? No, don't, don't, don't say 34. it. We're... No, 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 no. We're... Oh, okay. Okay. we're on the air. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. Oh, that's okay. No, no, no. That's okay. Our problem. Okay, we'll be right back with our live show in a minute. Uh, I'll, call, I'll call him back on the cell line. Thanks. Okay, so now he is at a number that I don't have. Cool, cool. All right. Well, that's neat. Um, hopefully somebody also working on the show will realize this, and uh, we can get him on the line. I need his number, though. We're kind of going late. Well, he's 10 minutes late now. It's been a long one. But um, I wonder if I can... Um, she's um, Kim's uh, getting getting things together with the, the, the correct number this time, so I would like to take this opportunity to do a little bit of a commercial. All right? Can we do that? Oh, that wasn't... There we go. Fantastic. Well, guess what? Uh, we've been talking a lot on the show about uh, hemp, uh, some other cool developments going on growing hemp, not, not necessarily cannabis, but hemp in the States. But I've been contacted by some folks down in Missouri, and they are excited to announce that the new approach Missouri Medical Cannabis Language has been officially certified for the November 6th ballot by the Secretary of State's office. 
they will be a yes on the amendment. So that's pretty cool. Uh, their language has broad support from veterans, health care providers, and most importantly, patients. <laughs> Right? Like where they should have started consulting with people in Canada instead of ignoring them and winding up with what they've got. Okay. So the new approach, Missouri, and you can find them on Facebook. Uh, it says here that um, they are trying to make Missouri the 31st state to allow doctors to recommend medical cannabis to patients with serious and debilitating illnesses. Amendment 2 is the best initiative for Missouri veterans and patients. Join us. Well, them. I'm not, you know, I'm not a Missouri veteran. Or, but I'm, I'm a patient. But in spirit, join us in voting yes on two. Amendment two. We couldn't have done this without your support. Thank you to everyone who has given their time, money, and volunteer efforts to this important issue. Our work is not done. I think we can all say that. Uh, now we need your help in educating the public about our language and getting out the vote. So if you're in Missouri or in the States, uh, maybe a neighbor Missouri down there, and you tell your friends who live there, November 6th, vote yes on Amendment 2. It's a big deal. Um, this thing is, is creeping across the nation and the planet. And the quicker these uh, repressors realize that, uh, the better it is. So get on out there. And a New Approach Missouri, and, and definitely vote yes on two come the election, November 6th. All right, now, now we're going to do a different number. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Bruce is on the line. He's on the line. And here we go. I'd have to get it. It was a different number. That's what happened. You know, when you're a lawyer, you're going to be on the move like that, I guess. Uh, right? paste that thing in there oh boy this is getting so hard for me to my phone is not answering question here oh god uh how come i can't put a one <laughs> gotta put a one in there right it's got to be able to have a one it's always at the end of them this is the worst connection of ever we had to have one sometime we had to have the worst connection at some point uh, I can't seem to get the one in front of the 310. I don't know if my fingers are too stupid or what's the deal here. It keeps popping it on at the end there. I can't, you know, I got to get the one in there. Just see if Russell's going to try to put a one in front of the three. Yeah, see what I mean? Fucking irritating. Oh, boy. Fantastic. And it disappears? What? Oh. I hate this stuff, you know. I really. This is why you do a two-hour show and cut it down to an hour. There it is, there. Oh, you gonna put a one in there? Okay. We need to put the lines in there. <laughs> oh God! So that was a good commercial, right? For for those guys. Okay, so I'll close out the theme for them because they, you know, they got the um, the intro theme, and now. Uh, and now we'll say goodbye. Vote yes on on that second prop. All right, let's call him, please. Please, can we just connect this time without all the 15 troubles of hell? Let's have it. All right. Mr. Yeah. Mark Olin speaking. Can I help you? Hello, Bruce. This is Alan calling Green Crush. You're live. How are you today? Beautiful. Nice speaking to you. How's things up in Canada? Well, we've had a crazy start, just like usual with the show, but otherwise things are good. Um, we're on a different political landscape, though, uh, than you are, but I'm um, still involved in this entire legalization process, and uh, I know you know tons about that that will so apply to not only Canadians, but anybody that speaks English. Uh, but you are right. yep. based in California, and uh, just tell the folks a bit about your start. I mean, you've been—I said I told them already—you've been doing this for 50 years, and you've been focusing on cannabis for for like the last 20. We've talked about your publication. Um, tell us how you kind of got into it. Well, I started my practice in 1967, and uh, I remember one of the first cases I had was a case involving a bunch of kids who got busted in a hippie house here in L.A. You know, hippie house. Sorry about the noise. And uh, at the end of the game, one guy was going to be facing the music, was to sing. And as a young lawyer, I said, you know, Your Honor, I just got out of law school and I understand the purpose of, 
punishment is to punish the intended wrong. What's the intended wrong when it comes to someone involved with marijuana? The owner just looked at me and looked around the courtroom and said, you know, uh, young man, he broke the law. At that point, I realized that I had to do more than fight the courtroom because I wasn't going to get justice there. So I went out and started my practice as director of torch marijuana legalization. I ran for the state assembly in 1970 and I uh, had a very good showing. I almost lost a beat up the incumbent, 26 year incumbent, and got, uh, you know, it's like 50, 40, 48% of the vote. People realized that this was going to be a after that, uh, this legalization platform was, uh, was legitimate. I ran again several times on the legalization platform, always showing very well in campaigns. I was after governor of the state of California in 2003. I ran again in 2013 for U.S. Congress on the legalization platform again, showing very good results. Even though I wasn't a political, you know, savvy, uh, I wasn't uh, you know, well healed in the campaign, but. It, it, it sparked the attention of the candidates and other candidates around the state, and I think helped push the river. I've also been the director of Normal and founder of Normal in Los mm-hmm. Angeles since, 19, since 1973, the National Organization of Reform Marijuana Laws. And so I've been down for the cause for many, many years. As you indicated, I followed this guide for 22 years to try to help people stay out of trouble by realizing what the law is, because you know the best way. To stay out of trouble is to know the law and know your rights. And people didn't know the law. And right now you can see how complicated the law remains when it comes to marijuana. It's a, you know, it's a very difficult situation here in California, like most other states. There's laws, I've, I've stacked other laws, and I can explain that to you if you want to hear about it. Yeah, let's do that. Let's, all the laws. let's do that because... Um, okay. I really want to get into the specifics of California. Obviously, you're an expert there, and it'll it'll pan out across the country. But uh, uh, given okay. your your time uh, doing this and focusing on cannabis issues and and the rights, you you just see the unreasonableness. I mean, that's at the core of it for you, right? It's just completely unreasonable to jail someone yeah, yeah. for doing this. I mean, that's the whole bottom end yeah. of it. Obviously, I mean, I was shocked as a young boy to see young people going to jail along with robbers and rapists. I just couldn't believe it. And, uh, you know, it was the time when you know, a lot of young people involved with marijuana it, it became, you know, a statement of defiance of authority. And uh, people went to jail. I mean, my clients have been very well for I'm famous in many cases. I've defended no marijuana cases to any lawyer in the United States, I'm proud to say. And they're very successful. But it doesn't mean people didn't go to jail on occasion. And some people went to jail for a long time, especially when they had priors and the, the cases that were involved, you know, tons of dope. And it was still not right because, again, I didn't break the law. There was no intention to hurt anybody or otherwise. Right. Yeah. So, so, we, so the, the history of the law goes like this, okay? We, when I started my practice in 1967, any amount of marijuana was a felony, punished by state prison up to five years. And some people got that kind of stuff. For example, Timothy Leary, who was a Professor at Harvard, I don't know if you know who he was. You know, sure, Kennedy, of course. Was? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Well, he went to prison for five years because the judge didn't like the fact that he thought he was promoting dope kids. And uh, it wasn't fair, it wasn't just. He actually escaped from prison, and I defended him in the 1973 with state charges. But there's an example of how the laws are used as a political weapon yeah. against a perceived, the perceived user. We had Richard Nixon, the president, who made it made it a, a scapegoat for all his wrongdoings to try to blame marijuana users for the problems of the country. <laughs> Nevertheless, we keep going. So what happened after we had those laws, finally, in about 1976, we were able to pass a Moscone bill, was called, which that was the name of the legislator, Moscone, and that reduced marijuana possession to just $100 fine. It's a misdemeanor for less than an hour, and over and out, it was a misdemeanor, then anything else was possession for sale, for selling it, all that. It still made the felony. And that, that worked out that it was better, but it still didn't help people that could legally get it. So then we passed Senate Bill 420 in 2005, I believe it was. And that provided for patients to provide for patients on a nonprofit basis, and also provided for collectives so that patients could have come together and be able to grow it. 
in a, in a collective environment. And that, out of that sprung the dispensaries because you couldn't go to people's houses to start pouring weed. So the dispensaries were morphed into the uh, existence, and we have thousands of dispensaries all over the state of California. And uh, those were supposed, well, were supposed to be collective that were non-profit, but the law was ambiguous about what profit was, the DA's argue, arguments that they didn't really have a basis to claim, and it went on and on, but there was so much confusion. If you look at my guide, if you go, anybody wants to look at my guide on 420laws.com. 420laws.com, yeah. Yep. Yeah. In there, you'll see all these cases that are relevant to medical marijuana uh, decisions by the courts of appeal. Cases about describing what is a collective, you know, how much can a patient have, um, all the cases saying whether or not you could travel with marijuana, which wasn't in the statute. You see, the problem is these laws, all the criminal laws, and all laws generally, is that the, the statutes themselves do not define how it's impl- yeah. implicated. And so it takes cases where people get convicted to appeal them, the courts of appeals, and then they come out with their rulings about, under this circumstances, this is how the law applies. Under those circumstances, how the law applies. Wow. That goes on and on. One example is, I remember one case in particular that I often came up, People versus Wayman. P- I'm sorry, I didn't, had, I didn't hear that. What was that? People. But the name of the case is People versus Wayman, not a tort. This oh, is the defendant's right. name, okay? Sure. In that case, uh, the defendant was driving around with some marijuana in his car, which he was considered was medical marijuana. He said he kept it in his car because his mother didn't like it at the house, and therefore he kept his stash in his car. Right. And the Court of Appeals ruled you can't, you can't store marijuana in your vehicle. You only can transport it for your current medical needs. So there's an example. So the kid had no idea what to expect. He didn't know that's how the court's going to rule. He told the truth that he had medical marijuana. They conceded it was medical marijuana, but the court of appeals sustained his conviction because it wasn't being transported for his current medical needs. Wow. So these kind of cases are going back and forth and back and forth yeah. for years, okay? Yep. And people come in my, people come in my office like deers with headlights on them. They didn't know what the hell happened, okay? <laughs> yeah. And so... So, on, on that uh, note, do you mind, I'm just going to cut in here. I want to ask you something specifically on that note, because this walks right up to a, a question I already had, which is uh, most people, <clears throat> or a lot of people, I guess, uh, don't really know what's going on with the laws in, in their state or, or federally or what have you, and they get arrested and they call they call a lawyer, but by that time they've already been somewhat processed right. by the police. They've already been sort of answered a bunch of things. They've already said things maybe they should have said, maybe they shouldn't have. Who knows what? Until the lawyer is on board. So I find it uh, fascinating, and I want you to kind of walk us through this. On your um, on your guide that's available that we have here, and you can get it from 420 Laws, 420laws.com or download the app or both, um, you talk about uh, an invocation of rights wallet-sized card that you have. Right. Uh, tell us, right. tell us what that is, what it does, why you should have something like that, and and what you're doing wrong when you start, you know, telling well, them all kinds of all, things. I tell, first, I tell people you always should be respectful to police. Okay. However, what happens is people try to explain themselves to police officers, think that they're going to give a break or they're going to judge the facts. They're not there to judge the facts. They're there to find as much evidence against you as possible. So as soon as you start speaking to a police officer. You start opening the Pandora's box and saying something could be twisted by the cop or something that's going to hurt your case. So you do have rights in America to say you have a right not to speak to a police officer while being investigated. And they're supposed to advise you of the, of the rights regarding the land versus Arizona, which is the right to remain silent. However, they don't have to advise you of those rights until they, quote, arrest you. So during the course of the, what's called the detention, they don't have to advise you of rights. And so unless you're arrested, then they have to advise you of the rights before they question you further. So this little card says, you know, I don't want to be detained. I don't want to consent to a search. I don't want to make any statements without a lawyer or present. And I don't wish you to discuss my decision in this regard. And I'd like to be released. Now, the cop could take that card and throw it in the trash. On the other hand, he is kind of stumbling that they have a problem here. You can see that right off. So that may save people from getting in trouble if they have that little card in their pocket, okay? Yeah. And so 
That's what people should best understand. They don't need my card. You just have to know the law. The law is you don't have to consent to a search. You don't have to talk to police officers when they start asking you questions unless you voluntary. Well, unless you do it voluntarily. You can just simply say, officer, I prefer not to be detained. I don't want to make any statements. I don't want to consent to anything. I'd like to go. So if the cop plays the state at all, you're kind of stuck in a situation where you're going to have to uh, come up with some other basis to take to possess the earth for sales or that you were, that you were uh, doing something that would make it under the law illegal. That's the story on that. Yeah, well, so that's a good idea. People, Most people don't. They've already yeah. said something, uh, uh, you know, really self-damning without even realizing it. Uh, you know, the longer they spend yeah. with the cop before before they've got someone on their side. But I don't know what the law is in Canada. Do you have those kind of rights in Canada? But we, we have we, we have similar rights, but but again, I, I don't know all of our rights up here. I do know they're somewhat different from the states. We don't have the Miranda rights, but uh, you, you are supposed to be informed of certain things, but I, I'm not an expert on that. We'll talk to some Canadian lawyers okay. <laughs> later yeah, on. But um, how has it been the landscape of for you as a lawyer in California dealing with cannabis, how has your day-to-day kind of changed be- be- between last year and then January 1st, 2018, it was legal for recreational, right? Did that did that change your game? Com- com- completely different, okay? Yeah. I, two years ago, I would have maybe five cases a day on my calendar, okay? And the courtrooms were filled with marijuana cases. Half the calendar in the criminal courts for marijuana cases. It was ridiculous, all yeah, right? Yeah. That is, that's completely gone at the moment. So there's very, very few busts at all in California. They are beginning to pick up and fall a little more now because they're trying to enforce the laws regarding dispensaries and co-ops and things yeah. like that because they want, they want people to get a license so they can get make the bucks off of it because sure. the license, they have to pay taxes. So they're, they're coming around again and I'm getting calls daily of people that have grows up in Northern California and Southern California. They're getting investigated by the cops. And well, uh, we're doing that in Canada, right, too. Right. That's where we're the same. <laughs> we, yeah. We're identical so, on that front, yeah. Yeah. So you've legalized it in Canada, in Canada but they're going after the people. you have licensing there or what? Is that what's happening? Well, what's happening? Yeah, there've been diff- there were medical licenses before, and, and what's going on here is... Um, well, I'd like to get a, you know, if you knew more about it and had the time to look at it, you'd be appalled, I'm sure. But basically what they have yeah. here is a system uh, of the medical cannabis access is is already in play, and you've already been able to use that. But the, the main point is that now that the, the uh, recreational is coming online, it doesn't matter whether you're using it recreationally or if you have it in your system because it's a medical need, your medicine, in other words. What they've got here is the Draeger Drug Test 5000. I don't know if you know this thing, but um, this is this is a test to determine at the side of the road whether or not you are impaired by cannabis. But their their definition of impaired is basically that you have it in your system at all. Which is ridiculous. Yeah. I'll tell you something. You know, I, I, there's a case recently came down in the court of appeals. It was a civil case, all right, mm. where, they, where the defendant that was had the accident was charged with the baby being sued for having a, a lack of criminal integrity. And the, the uh, prosecutor or the plaintiff wanted to show that the person used or had used marijuana. And the court held that the use of marijuana is irrelevant to whether you're impaired. Yeah. The fact that you have, in fact, you have THC in your system or, uh, or the yeah. boxy which is left over, is relevant to show impairment. So what the I reality think... Is Sorry, go ahead. Go so ahead. That's, well, that court, that, that, that court sustained, and that went to the Court of Appeals in that state, and the Court of Appeals sustained the court's view on it, that no water in your system is no evidence of impairment in and of itself. Yeah. However, what happens when people get stopped with DUI cases is that the cop says, I'd like to ask you if you take a few tests here, mm-hmm. to walk the line, touch your nose, or stand mm-hmm. your head back. You yeah. Know, all that, that's, that is, Voluntary. They can't force you to do that in oh. the states of California. Okay, check this yeah, out then. You, check this out then. BC, British Columbia, just north of you, north of Oregon. Um, their their system of roads. So that's one of the provinces uh, of the ten provinces. Everybody's hitting it differently. The federal. Everybody's interpreting the federal regulations differently. But if you get pulled over for 
for that kind of thing in British Columbia. They're not going to test you at the side of the road. This is their plan, apparently. Uh, just in B.C., they're, they're, they're not going to test you at the side of the road. They're going to assume that you need testing, and they're going to uh, incur all of the difficulties of getting yourself, and I don't know about your vehicle, I really don't know, but getting you down to the police station where you will be detained long enough for them to have what's now known as a uh, drug recognition expert, a.k.a. A, a different cop at the RCMP station, and he is going to put you through a battery of tests once you've already left the scene of the thing and been transported to the station, et cetera, then this guy's going to come in and test. This is for everybody they pull over. I mean... Well, let me tell you something. You cannot be taken from a police station unless they have probable cause to arrest you. And in our state, in our country, they try to show these filter of body tests so they kill these heal the people when they take them, okay? Yeah. So they're gonna, cops are going to claim to touch, touch your nose properly. You made an admission that you were using recently. So yeah. I don't know what, in your country, they could take it to jail and hold you and detain you like that. To me, that's no thing of arrest. It's an unlawful arrest. Yeah. And in our country, in our country, if the evidence comes as a result of an unlawful arrest, yeah. then it's inadmissible, it's inadmissible in court. Well, the kernel of so this that, that, that I think brings it forth is that the, well, I was going to call him a gentleman, but then I'd be misspeaking. The man who put the laws together for Canada under our prime minister, the federal uh, minister who designed our uh, federal architecture, uh, which is ridiculous, by the way, of, of cannabis proliferation, acceptance, uh, consumerism. The guy that built that is actually, um, before he was a government minister, he was a long-term police chief for both the province, um, I think it was the province of Ontario, and also the city of Toronto for a long time. Um, and in 2010... He was enforcing a fake law that didn't wasn't really on the books, but they said it was to detain people who were outside of the protest area. Like there's a protest area for the G20 conference. And then there were folks, you know, in that portion of the city who were kettle uh, kettled, you know, and the cops kind of form a, a block, yeah. a human chain around uh, yeah. a major intersection of Queen of Spadina and Toronto. They kettled. Uh, hundreds of people. Now, some of them, you know, they're people shopping, walking around with their little puppy and, you know, having a Sunday afternoon or whatever. And they arrested dozens of these people, put them in an artificial, a, a temporary short-term holding tank, a fenced-in series of pens used in the film industry, um, and kept people there without water and access to medicine for hours and hours and hours. And these folks have been, sub this was in 2010, they've subsequently been um, getting out of, um, their legal troubles of that by by suing and winning money. Now this is because this law wasn't even a law, and this guy said that it was a law when it wasn't a law, and he's never been reprimanded whatsoever. And now he's the architect of some of the most draconian uh, laws around cannabis you've ever seen. So maybe that's why you know we're uh, different from you guys. This guy is unchecked yeah. as a rights abuser already. Well, nevertheless, let's go back to the California law so people know what's going on sure, here. Sure, right on. Let's do that. Okay. I, okay, number two. So it's, 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 it's passed. We've had other initiatives on the ballot that have been fighting for these, these initiatives for many, many years. Recently, the council was called Prop 64. Prop 64 was basically came out of Sacramento, which is our capital of California, by the politicians, okay? Right. They didn't really talk, they didn't talk to people that were on the ground very much, so-called activists. And uh, it, it was it was uh, promoted by the uh, lieutenant governor. He was a good guy, and but he of course they want to compromise everything they're doing on this kind of uh, legislation in order to get their votes. For example, in California, you can't smoke in public. All right, you can't smoke any place unless you have a, a resident, or unless you have a, a, a condo or a apartment where the landlord will allow you to go and smoke. Right. Uh, on the premises, okay? Uh -huh. So that's one example. Beyond that, we legalized one ounce of marijuana, what, in which you could possess, you could transport, and you can give away for no profit. Okay? Beyond that, they reduced all the felonies to misdemeanors. And beyond that, if you've been convicted of a felony in the past, you could bring it back to court and reduce those felonies to misdemeanors and have them expunged. So they try to make amends for the people that got so screwed by the marijuana laws over the many years, the last yeah. hundred years, since 100 years, since 2000, since 1915, 
when the first arrest took place in California. And since then, hundreds of thousands of people have been prosecuted and incarcerated and destroyed their, destroyed their lives, their families, yeah. and their ability to get back to the mainstream of society. They could get jobs. They were completely screwed, all right? So Prop 64 provides that, uh, shall we say, uh, opportunity to be able to at least correct your record. And then beyond that, uh, from there, uh, we have provided for licensing in all areas of marijuana. Cultivation, cultivation, uh, manufacturing, even with volatile substances, uh, dispensaries, uh, so et, what, et cetera, et cetera. What does one do if you're allowed to have cannabis and then your landlord says, no, you can't consume it here and no, you can't grow any here? Then, then what? Well, that's that is one of the big problems we're having and one of the reasons that I've been so engaged with my practice with my, as, my, as a criminal lawyer and as a director of normal, getting the city of Los Angeles to agree to have what's called on-site consumption because it is allowed under the law, under the state law. However, the state law is defined in a way that says each city and county has the autonomy to decide for themselves to what degree they want to participate in the licensing of these kind of activities. They can't not deny you the right to have an ounce of wheat. They can't deny you the right to grow six live plants in your residence. Wow. However, they can say they don't want to have on-site consumption licenses given out. They can say they don't want to have dispensaries in their community. They don't want to have manufacturing in their community. So each city and county has that right. In the city of Los Angeles, I'm very on game with this situation. I've got many articles about me on the front page of LA Times, etc. Et I just fighting for this on site consumption license because one of the reasons they pass these laws is why they're kind of rubbing their hands together in anticipation of making a lot of tax money is because we're going to have a lot of tourists come into California. Yeah. They did Colorado, etc. <laughs> yeah. And I'm trying to explain to them where these tourists are going to go. They've not got no place to smoke. They're just going to force them to the violate the law. In Italy, it's not a serious law, but it's a hundred dollar fine for the penalty assessment. It's about five hundred wow. bucks if they stick smoking in public. And beyond that, we're going to invite people to California, go and go shopping through your week. You don't know what kind of week you're going to get because you can't smoke it anywhere. And then if you do want to smoke it, you have to do it illegally. So it's really yeah. unfair not to have on-site consumption. Yeah. And of course, I'm down for it because I want a few hats in my life. You know, by the way, you mentioned this called recreational marijuana, right? Well, that's what they call it, yeah. I, I know, and I think that's a, a degrading. Of it. It's, it's, oh, me too. It's, it's, I, important. Yeah. it's, it's, degrading cause it's a spiritual substance given to you by the Lord, okay? It's a, it's a, it's a sacrament, all right? Yeah. And, uh, and so uh, we call it, we try to avoid that term and call it adult use because that's what we have. We have adult use for people 21 and older. We also have use by patients, no matter what age you are, if the doctor recommends it, you could use yeah. it. Okay, if you're five years old or 50 years old. Well, okay? plus there's the issue so of, like, if, if I'm using a medical cannabis product of some nature, uh, and then I pass it over to you because you're beside me and we are partaking of this in some area where it's legal, um, are you now smoking a recreational joint or are you smoking a, a medical joint? Or what is it for you? You know, <laughs> like, a, it, well, first, first away that you can give way up to an ounce. Okay. So it would not be, you can give it away for no profit, okay? Yeah. So as long as there's no compensation, uh, then you can give it away. So that would be no problem. What you would be subject to is a ticket for smoking in public, all right? Okay. Or if you, or if you live in an apartment, the landlord could throw your butt out, okay? Which is, in, in some case, something else. Another problem we have is that the law didn't change the rights of employers to fire people or not hire them if okay. they use marijuana. Yeah. Okay. I wanted now, to get into that uh, and, employment and drug testing. Um, you're working somewhere, yeah. and uh, you're you've, you've got a job someplace. Okay. And now you have this condition, or or some reason it's your medicine now, and um, and you're not allowed to maybe smoke it at home, and you're not allowed to grow any. And now you got a job where you're not allowed to have any in your system. Maybe they're going to test you. I mean, what do we do no, about that? Well, let me call. Let me talk to you about that. I have two things, two points I want to pick up. Okay. These oh, employers these sure. days are using this using this law in order to fire people who are ready for retirement, okay? You got it? Mm-hmm. The guy's been there for 45 years, 
you're supposed to get a retirement of you know, two hundred and fifty dollars a week for the rest of his life. How are we going to fire his ass for years and weeks? It's a pretty convenient way to avoid the cost of retirement for these big companies. Cal Normal has the legislation right now up in Sacramento that we think it's going to pass. It provides that California employers can no longer fire you or refuse to hire you if you're using marijuana. Okay? So we hope that will pass. And that's the kind of thing we do in Normal. We represent the consumer. We're not about saying that dope dealer or anything. We're about saying the consumer try to protect them anywhere we can. We provide a, a much. Hold on. Hold on. Hold okay, on, hold sure. On, we'll be right back. Okay, no problem. I'm not. I'm not taking it. Don't worry. Oh, okay. Um, so, so Cal, we represent the consumer, and uh, there's some examples of what we do at the normal, the actual organization before the marijuana laws. We have an office in Washington D.C. We began that for that that organization in 1972. And as I told you earlier, I found it, and the director of Normal in California, Los Angeles, Normal, since 1973. So we're out there fighting to fight the people. Yeah. Anyway, the point is, the point is this is all very unfair that they use marijuana as a basis to fire people and not hire them, and it's, uh, it's bad. Now, the federal government also is a problem because they, uh, they also will not allow people to participate with you to me. And if you work for any kind of uh, employer that has federal funding or what's said, you're out of the picture here. So unfortunately, we can't control that. Things will change. We have several bills in Congress right now. We have a bipartisan bill in the U.S. Congress to give it give new states rights. In other words, states, states rights. Oh, for here we go. It means that the government, yeah. federal government is going to stay on the states where they have decided for themselves how they want to do with weed, okay? Yeah, okay. So, uh, so let's get back to testing, yes, drug testing. Now, I have a little portion of that in my guide about drug testing. It says that um, there's, there's really no way to clean the system as far as I know. People have products and all full of crap, okay? Yeah. The other thing you can do, you can exercise and you can drink a lot of water, but not too much because you don't want to dilute your urine too much to be suspicious of that. But exercise and just with this can be the only way you can, you can help your system. Also, all these stores, Rite Aid, all these, all these different kinds, of, they have testing kits. So if people are going to face testing, they can check that out. But the important part is we need the public to bring up the inequities of this kind of thing and to argue that the only basis in which someone should be fired is that if they're impaired, small employed, okay? Yeah. That they're you know, if they're impaired, they should have tests for impairment, et cetera. Now, speaking about testing and deciding who's impaired and who's not, in California, the California Top 64 provides $2 million a year for continued investigation of what causes impairment, whether it be marijuana or some pharmaceutical drugs or whether it's NyQuil or whether it's uh, yeah. you know, Advil PM, PM. You know, we should have a standard to establish how it is that yeah. or not. We hear about all these they highway collisions and, and car accidents that go on in our city and in any city, and there's never, um, you know, if he's a drunk driver, they'll say, oh, a drunk driving incident happened and this is a terrible thing, and it is. Um, but they don't seem to say, uh, oh, this guy was on Xanax, this guy was on, uh, you know, whatever. They don't get into they don't get into pharmaceuticals. They'll go into drunk driving. Oh. I'm sure they'll go into, oh, this guy was found... You know, with uh, two nanograms of uh, <laughs> two nanograms of cannabis in his system. I mean, uh, yeah, it, yeah. Well, that's, that's exactly right. Now, now some states have a thing, like I think uh, Utah says, if you have five nanograms or more, you are presumptive guilty, just like you have point oh eight yeah. alcohol content in system. But isn't now, isn't the now, nanograms far different from the, the the alcohol readings? I mean, you know, what's a nanogram? That's like yes, nothing. Yeah, the, 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 that doesn't mean anything. It's got them telling you that. The court have held that the fact that you have THC in your system is irrelevant to whether you're impaired. Because impairment doesn't mean you're under the influence. Being under the influence is not illegal. Mm -hmm. It's being impaired. That means unable to operate a motor vehicle safely. That's what impairment is. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. And people necessarily, the people on weed are not necessarily, in some cases, maybe otherwise. And by the way, I'm talking about otherwise. It's got to be careful using edibles. All right, folks? You better know what you're doing before you take an edible. Oh, sure, mouth. yeah, yeah, better, yeah. Absolutely. And before, when you take, you take an edible, you better wait two hours at least 
before you go anywhere so you can evaluate the effect on that edible. Yeah. Because what people do, they get these munchies, they get these nice little good cookies or whatever they got. Yep. And they say, oh, this one's great. It's delicious. You know, I'm not <laughs> kidding you. I'll take another one. I'll take another one. Next thing they're throwing up on themselves. Yeah, right? yeah. So I want to make sure people understand that. So this is the kind of thing we've been talking about since the beginning. The duty of the governments are to advise us of the dangers of use and abuse, provide programs of rehabilitation, yeah. and continue the scientific evaluation of the effects of using these different kinds of substances. Right. Which They're they, not going to go away. No, they put on the back burner forever. They kept saying, well, we can't test it because it's illegal, you know, knowing full exactly. well that... But, but, but what's happening now is that is the Pandora's box has opened up for the legalization of the United States, and they are finding out such great benefits to the sake of those provides for oh, mankind. Yeah. I mean, it's amazing. I get calls every day, people thanking, oh my God, I can't believe what happened. I had a guy call me yesterday, a lawyer I've known for 50 years, okay, a very okay. good lawyer. He said, Bruce, you know, I've been suffering for Alzheimer's, and I finally thought you're not going to go down and try to know and I can't believe I would change my whole life wow. just smoking a joint. I never, I mean, it's amazing how this guy spoke. As a matter of fact, today, I was in court in the LAX courthouse, which is the airport courthouse, and the DA that was on the case, he told me he knew this guy, Nick. And that he, as a matter of fact, he was a very good friend of his. And Nick tells me in the afternoon, a couple of DAs and some judges come up and it's uh, it about 4 o'clock in the afternoon, they all get stoned, okay? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it's crazy. But he said it really has affected him in such a positive way, he's overwhelmed with it. And of course, we don't, we don't, there's no more antelope, antelope. Then we have science to prove right. that no water is very effective. With Absolutely. People that have, uh, have seizures and kids that are suffering from diseases that no other drugs could help them with. Yeah. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a gift from God. Now, I'm not promoting the water. I, I'm not, I love it myself. I'm not promoting it. You don't use it? My poor, but I'm, I said I love it. Oh. I'm saying... I, so, but I'm not promoting it. I'm promoting oh, okay. people's choice. Right. I, I'm promoting the choice. People have the choice to decide for themselves how they want to take care of their bodies, okay? Yeah. Because we have we have a constitution that says we have a right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Sure. I think marijuana comes as, 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 in that category for all three of those. Yeah, that's right. It, it, hey, as your long-term... Your life, it, it does. It, it can. It can, right? Can extend your extended mind. That's why I'm here talking to you right now. Hundred percent. Extended your life. Yeah. yeah. It's supposed to be dead. Well, yeah. Yeah. Hey, as a long term, uh, as a long term litigator, <laughs> a lawyer for for fifty years, but more more. Uh, I'm just going to focus this on uh, your time primarily dealing with cannabis. Have you ever seen or known about a member of the judiciary, such as a judge or a state prosecutor or something? Uh, partaking of cannabis while enacting the um, the judicial duties of punishing people for the same thing. I don't know. I can't say I know any lawyers. They, they just got a bench stone. I can't say that. I've never gone to court ever stone in my fifty years. Okay. No, not you. Okay. I just mean it. Like not not to, to, not a court. But do you know like someone might you know you're not allowed to drink, and meanwhile they got a bottle of scotch in their desk. Unfortunately, the judges go to lunch and have their, they have their, their, their afternoon vodka. Who knows what goes on with them? But you asked me whether I know. You asked me whether I knew a judge or a prosecutor that basically came to court stone. Is that no, 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 no. That's not what I meant. Not that they came to court stone. I'm just saying. Uh, I, I'm more. I'm, I'm trying to pull open a tile on if there's any hypocrisy in a person who partakes of cannabis. Um, you know, recreationally, whenever they want to do it. But then when they go to their job, they're busting people or processing people or, or, or sentencing people for the same thing that they do sometimes also. Yeah. Well, look, I don't know who's talking and who's smoking out there, who's all that. I can't predict that. But I do know <laughs> the judges, the judges, the judges were asking me, hey, Bruce, what's going to happen when they legalize marijuana? Yeah. I guess they were saying they're my practice. But you know what I tell them? What? I'm going to try to stop the honor. You're going to say what? Sorry, I missed that. I said the judge would ask me what's going to happen when they legalize marijuana. They were referring to my practice, you know? Oh, right, right. And I say, and I responded by saying, you know what, Judge, I'm going to try the stuff when they legalize it. Oh, I see. Right, like, sure. like I never used, like I never used it before. They, they thought it was a joke. Well, you should come up here. Um, we have a friend yeah, who's. Anyway, a, you could work up here, I'm sure. You'll be busy. 
Anyway, I'm I'm really, I'm really I'm, I'm, I feel very satisfied by my work. I've really been got a lot of a lot of uh, a lot of attention. There's a lot of articles written about me. It's also in my guys everything from our, from the from the Associated Press to, to the L.A. Times. I mean, a lot of people are aware of my my work, and I've had a lot of a lot of positive feedback. And I'm sure it's closed a lot of doors for me as well uh, behind the scenes, but ultimately now. I consider it some kind of big hero because I was down for the cause so long. Mm-hmm. Everybody knew about it. They thought I was really nuts, I'm sure, over the years. And now they see the light of day about the reality of how important this was. And number two is, guess what? Dogs aren't having kittens and cats aren't having puppies. Nothing changed because we did the last time. Right. And the statistics regarding the number of DUIs and marijuana have not gone up that they claim they're going to do. So all the all the naysayers and the people warning about the dangers of this drug are all full of crap, but they knew it from the beginning. And we've had enough experience with it over the last 50 years or more to know that no one has ever should have been legalized in the first place. It was a terribly, terrible result. Of, uh, a, lot of, a lot of cost to the government, a lot of cost to, to the law enforcement resources, and it was a terrible, uh, terrible thing. That happened to the people that Absolutely. Were caught up with the well, prosecution. What do you think now, you, what, you aren't able to do now because you're, what, what are you saying? You've lost some opportunities, perhaps? Uh, what kind of things are, do you mean? Well, I don't know. I'm just saying, who knows what my bills would open for me if I had to donate to an advocate to change the marijuana laws. I don't know anything. Oh, so you could never here. become a judge or something, right? I could be a judge. I could have been a judge. I didn't want to be a judge. I was offered the judge when I first started my practice. Many years ago, <laughs> but I didn't want to be a judge. You know why? Why? Guess what judges do all day long? I don't know. Tell me. What do you me. think they do? I think they. I think they. they I, I don't know. I think they read up on the case a little bit and then uh, you know go out there they, and, and listen they, to it. And and then they sentence their asses. That's all they do. Yeah. Sentence people well, all true. day long. That's yeah. all. And they don't know crap about who they really are. They don't know anything about their backstory. They got a one-page probation report. You've got this conviction, that conviction, this is the crime, this is the time. It's so arbitrary. It's yeah. so unjust. Well, I agree. Oh, so for sure. 100%. Unfair. So I don't want to throw I don't want to throw the bench and start sentencing people all day long. They have no time to really evaluate the the, the, the relevance of what kind of punishment they deserve or don't deserve. And using this idea that they broke the law when it comes to marijuana as a basis to punish somebody is like a bootstrap argument, you know? Yeah. That's so, amazing. Um, so this is, yeah, but wow. as far as the doors opening and closing, I don't have I have no concern about doors opening and closing in my life. I've had a beautiful experience being a lawyer. Yeah, I've done plenty of traveling and plenty of research, and plenty of teaching my spiritual uh, understanding of the world. And so I'm pretty uh, proud of my uh, my life and what's gone on. Stuff. I have four children, all of them very very talented. I thought of it. Columbia and Harvard Law School, and other daughter went to Berkeley at Columbia. She's a, a very well known writer. If somebody online there uh, listening to us wants to look her up, this little Madison Mars Holden, that's what may be. I so she writes articles about all over the world use of marijuana. She writes it for everything from, from wow. the village boys to the rest of the I think that's okay. how it used to be. You know, I think we would come yeah. from that originally. It was all over the world. A couple, right? Well, I'm telling you, she writes about thinking like what they're doing in, in uh, Israel with the, the science of marijuana. She writes about yeah. South America. She writes about everything. She hasn't covered much about Canada, I have to tell you, and she probably would like to. <laughs> so maybe I'll have her interview you or something about an article. About sure. Because yeah, let's. Um... She, she, she enlightens people, you know, with her articles, which is followed by a lot, a lot of uh, leaders. And I'm proud of her. And I have a son at UCLA in law school. Right. He did very well. He graduated. From Berkeley to four point and I have a twelve year old, and I'm proud of that too. So that's my story. Wow, that's a good story. So, <laughs> that's yeah. a great story. I got, I got, I got, I got to brag about my kids. What else could I do? You know? Oh, sure. We all have to do that. Hey, don't you think yeah. the cannabis is just like uh, you said? It's a sacrament. It's it's not a recreational thing. I agree. Don't you also think it's a tool? It could be all that. It's all the above. I mean, it could be a recreational people, you know, take a talk and have a party. Okay, that's, that's you know. Yeah. But you also could do, you could also do have inner, inner, inner things about it. You know what? I just came back from Hawaii last, about a week ago and a half ago. 
at very close to some of the Baba Ramdas, formerly known as Dr. Richard Alpha from Harvard. You ever heard of Baba Ramdas? Uh, no, well, I don't know much about that at all. I just thought you were going to tell me it was well, burning he, up in he, lava. He was, he was, he was, born, he was a Harvard professor, head of a psychiatric department at Harvard, okay, back in the 1960s. Mm-hmm. And he, uh, Timothy Leary was also a professor there, and they began a program of uh, investigating psilocybin and LSD. And as a result of that, they uh, did a lot of, they were authorized by Harvard to have an investigative um, portion of the psychiatric department. And he gave it to people like they were in the, in the religious department to see how they affect their experience with closeness to God, etc., etc. Ultimately, uh, some buddy that was not a graduate student got some acid and he was thrown off for not watching the, 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 the back enough, okay? And so he ended up in India and uh, found a guru and changed his name to Baba Ram Das. He's famous in America. He, he put a book called Be Here Now about uh, things we're talking about. So anyway, I was talking about the other day about arguing with, 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 this, with the city council about why they right. should allow the use of marijuana. It, it, they should give us on-site consumption locations like if it's a church or a, or, a, or a store, whatever you want to do. I said to him, what can I tell him about the spiritual use of marijuana? He said, it's a path to God. A path to God. Now, that's one man's opinion, obviously. But many people will tell you that it's, it's, it's a religious experience to them. In India, the Sadhus and the saints use marijuana. And matter of fact, even though it's supposed to be illegal because the federal government of California and the United States Opposed to their their um, prohibition on all these different countries, uh, they still give the doctors who are the people that are seeking the enlightenment uh, the license to use marijuana. Okay, notwithstanding the fact that they don't make it illegal. My point is, it's a spiritual experience for many people. Absolutely. And I don't like I don't like the people and people enjoy that different stuff. But this thing called the recreational, I think. It is. So it's just another it, bag yeah. of tricks, you know, like when they say, oh, it's harmful for the children. What about the children? And then they go ahead and arrest all these people and ruin their families and their, their time in school yeah. and, and all of and, that. And first of all, children are not smoking weed, okay? It's the two is far between the two. It's still illegal in California. You've got to be 21 or over, otherwise you face the misdemeanors, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, fair enough, sure. Uh, I mean, so... The only thing you have to concern yourself about is edibles. That if people get them, they get stolen. The kids are not, that would not be good for them. You have to be careful not to make them available. Kids are not going to go rip off some butt off of a, a plant in the backyard and start smoking it, okay? Yeah. This is all, for no one to be active, it's got to be heated, okay? And so, no one off the butt is kind of dangerous to kids because there's no way they're going to get stolen. I don't care if they chew it all day long, yeah. okay? So it's, it's but we've all dealt with alcohol being illegal for most of our, you know, for our entire yeah. early lives until we're, what are you guys, 21 down there? So we we have 19 here, but 21, so, you know, that's the same thing. Yeah. I mean, you know, I, I don't, re- I don't uh, see the problem in, in them being honest enough to say, like, who's falling to these tricks? Like, what about the children? And then they ruin families forever. Hey, I asked you before about your business being, you know, lesser different with the legalization in California. Um, I wanted to also ask, so you must have had a, a, bir- a bird's eye view, hopefully. When um, when it went legal on January 1st, did you uh, did you figure there was some kind of a spike in sales at all? Oh, now it's legal, and a lot of people tried it, and, and where did that line go? Because this is something they're always saying is like, as soon as it goes legal, then all the kids are going to try it, and, you know, things are going to be it's madness. Not, there's no information that's true at all. There's no statistics or other things. I have nothing come to my attention. And by the way, I do do a lot of criminal practice that I do every day, but I'm also forced into a business for it now because I'm getting people licensing for all the things we considered illegal before. Right. And this is a big part. A big part of my practice is to help people get cannabis business licenses. And so instead of going to jail, now they can get licenses and they can go into business and make some serious dollars as a result of it. And uh, the industry is infantile. It's an industry right now. But it's, it's rocking. And these dispatchers are just have people lined up in front of them. And uh, 
it's a, is it a bad thing? I don't think so, especially if they stop using opiates or stop using alcohol. Right. The new, you know, it can benefit. And so uh, we know that the, the science of marijuana is it's not dangerous. It's the health maybe no evidence of that. It doesn't hurt your lungs. If there's no evidence of that. They, they had all this, this phony science that the prosecutors and the naysayers wanted to promulgate in order to justify the arbitrary view of it. And that's fell apart because the science does not support anything that justifies making it a crime. And sometimes I like to joke about it and say, how can a plant be a crime? That's what I want to know. Yeah. <laughs> a, plant, a plant comes out of the ground and it's fine. It's crazy, you know? That's, that's for and sure. So, uh, so we've touched about a few things here. Uh, I guess we could go out for two hours if you, you know, if you Listeners were up to it. Uh, yeah, no, we, we we've actually got to get going soon. Uh, unbelievable because okay, there, well, there's, the, there's so much more well, to cover. Can, but I want to make sure everybody has your contact information and, and send them where they can get this great info I was able to read yesterday. Well, well, thank you. I was quite kind of you to ask for that. First of all, you go to my website, 420laws.com. 420laws.com. Right, or you can call me at my office at 1 800 420 laws. Same thing. 420 LAWS or 5297. That's 1 800 420 5297 or 420 LAWS. I'll be glad to answer questions. People want to get into cannabis, give me a slice of field. I'm down for helping them. It's the time to do it. It's a very big opportunity. You got to have some bucks in the business, unfortunately, but it's a great opportunity for people to be able to participate in this area. Uh, entrepreneurialness, okay? Okay, well, so, th- we've finally it, gotten it, to the place where people can understand how, how valuable it is and, and how helpful it is. And, of course, uh, people that are like you that help us get through the quagmire are on the side of good. So thanks for doing what you do and helping people okay. out with what's basically an imposition of rights. So thanks for helping to fix that. Well, I want to thank you for the opportunity to, to be able to speak on this program. I felt uh, you know, honored to be able to spread the news and I appreciate this, uh, again, the opportunity to be able to well, thanks very much, and I'm going to take you up on your offer. We're going to contact, we're going to have Kim contact uh, the person you were mentioning earlier who also has papers on this. We want to get more information, so thanks for that. I'm not sure who you're talking about. Who's that? Who's that? You mentioned, Bert, you mentioned someone earlier in the show, but anyway, we have to get going. Well, we'll get back to you on it, and uh, we'd love to have you back on sometime, And uh, you know, because there are okay. hours and hours of this to talk about for sure. Oh, yeah. By the way, if you look at my guide on the line, 420laws.com, it tells a lot of information about it. So it could be helpful to people in Canada yeah. if they're trying to politicize this issue. Maybe if there's things there that they could do to help promote their freedoms there as well. Okay, well, thank you very much, Bruce. Bruce Margot okay, and everybody, thank thanks very much. Have a great rest of your day, and thanks for coming on Green, Green Crush. We'll talk to you again. Peace. Bye-bye. Peace. It's a sacrament. That's a good point. Uh, a lot of people uh, don't feel that way about it, but uh, he understands that. Bob Marley understands that. Of course, it's a sacrament. It's um, it's something you should be able to use recreationally. He finds that to be an insult. I understand that. People do use it recreationally, though, or that's other. But it's just something that should be okay to use. <laughs> that doesn't seem to be too outrageous but uh, hey before we get going we do have some announcements to make all right so um carrie lynn is a uh, friend of the show listens to the show regularly and carrie lynn has uh won herself the warren bobro book i think i announced this last week but i didn't announce maybe that we'd be mailing it out to you shortly so as soon as we can uh, confirm your address you get the warren bobro cannabis and cocktails book and uh, we also have another contest ongoing, and it's um, at Green Crush Pod. That'll get you into it. We have a, car- a contest brought to you by Prohibition Cannabis, and it's a great-looking box set uh, that you might be able to win, uh, unless you're a guy that's already won one uh, a couple of months ago. <laughs> so we will, uh, we'll see who uh, comes in on this one. Uh, this is going to be a great uh, Prohibition Cannabis. has uh, got some really cool accoutrements. For your cannabis needs, also uh, check us out on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at the Green Crush Pod. Uh, we're going to be giving that, that the last entry is Monday at midnight. Monday at midnight. So uh, anyway, 
that is our show for today episode 50 thank you very much for listening and um, you know what i'm going to put on some kind of theme song here should we do that yeah okay um this is alan park at green cross saying goodbye and come back next week <laughs>